All right, now it's time to move from the conceptual issues of phase space and uh, its potential utility, which actually we haven't quite touched on yet, but to discuss it within the context of Monte Carlo simulations or molecular dynamics simulations. So we finished last time with me uh, talking about a, a putative trajectory in phase space. And so I didn't do as good a job probably of uh, discussing this as I wanted to because I should have actually told you about the labeling on these axes. So in this case, T is time. So we're watching the evolution of the trajectory in time. And so this is really a conceptual picture. P is some high dimensional coordinate, right? It's all the, uh, all the coordinates in phase space. And so this hard black line is just trying to give you some sort of an indication of a motion. All right? It's all collapsed into a coordinate, if you like. But the point is that over time, although the true phase space trajectory is deterministic, when I take discrete time steps, so every one of these arrows ought to be roughly the same time step, I will have my atoms not quite at the position they were supposed to be based on the prior point, and the, I'll have new forces that are not exactly what the forces would be if I were on the exact trajectory. So to get a good mapping of a real system, one wants to try to stay as close as possible to a real phase space trajectory. So what, what is it about phase space that's useful? And the issue is that one wants to integrate over phase space properties. So what is a property? So a property is really a, a so-called expectation value. So that's a phrase many of you are probably uh, familiar with from quantum mechanics. And it really means the same thing within a thermodynamics perspective. That is, you have some sort of probabilistic distribution of possible values, and the expectation value will be the weighted average of all those possibilities. Uh, so in phase space, the way we think about that is, let's say there's some property, capital Xi, and I chose that letter just because I love that Greek letter and I love to say Xi, but the expectation value of Xi would be computed as an integral over phase space. So R, boldface R here, is collapsed into a single variable, capital R, all of the coordinates of phase space. So this integral is uh, convenient notationally, but in actual fact, there would be six n dimensions to capital R associated with the three position coordinates and the three momentum coordinates for every particle in the system. And there are n of those particles. So the value of my property, C at a given set of positions and momenta times the probability, P, of being at those positions and momenta. And presumably that probability is going to relate to energy in some way. We'll see that in a moment. Now it may be the case that my probability function, it's just not quite convenient to normalize it over phase space. That is, the integral of the probability over all possible coordinates and momenta may not actually equal 1 because the function I'm working with just doesn't have that property. Uh, of course, it's trivial then to simply normalize by whatever the probability does integrate to. And so that is what this is. And this looks very like a quantum mechanical uh, expression of the uh, expectation value as well. So property value times probability for a given position divided by integrated probability. And so where do we get the probability from? Well, it is Boltzmann weighted. So we take the exponential of the energy associated with a given set of coordinates and momenta. So I'm now breaking R out. Remember, R is 6n dimensional, where n is the number of particles. I'm going to break it into two bold face variables. Each of these is 3n dimensional. So there's three positions for every particle, and I'll call those Q, the coordinate uh, uh, variables. And there are 3n momentum variables, and I'll call those p. 
There's also a special name for this integrated probability in thermodynamics. This is called the partition function in thermodynamics. So you may recall the sum, because an integral is just a continuous sum. The sum over all possible energy states of a system is the partition function. I shouldn't say oh, the sum of this function over all possible energy states. So the exponential of minus the energy divided by Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So a, a key feature that should be kept in mind when thinking about evaluating a property's expectation value is, uh, coming back to this idea, what is an integral? Well, an integral is like a continuous sum. So if I'm going to sum together a whole bunch of things to get a final value, is there any point in looking at position slash momentum points in phase space R and computing, say, a property or a, expect, uh, sorry, a, a specific property value at the phase point, if I'm then going to go and multiply it times something extraordinarily close to zero. It won't contribute to my sum because I'm multiplying times nearly zero. And when is the probability very nearly zero? Well, when the energy becomes very, very high. So if E is, is huge, we really don't want to waste our time evaluating contributions to this integral in high energy regions of space. Now, the trouble is, of course, that phase space is enormous. We've already talked about sort of physical uh, space being three-dimensional for a potential energy surface, and they got big fast. Now you've basically doubled the number of dimensions. It's, it's horrific. So if you were to imagine that you had a relatively modest goal in mind, you simply want to put one phase point in every hyperoctant of your phase space. So if you like, <clears throat> you will look at a property for every atom either being to the left or right of a coordinate axis, x, y, or z. And also, when it's on the left or the right, it will either be moving in a positive direction or a negative direction. And just one, one point in every one of those hyperoctants, which is not a lot of sampling. Nevertheless, in order to do that, you would need 2 to the 6n power points. So that's a big number. When n is big, I'll let you uh, overflow your calculator if you'd like to do that. So it's completely impossible, actually, to do that sort of brute force sample of just saying, well, I'll, I'll let every atom go left, right, up, down, forward, backward. And while it's there, I'll also have momenta that are left, right, up, down, forward, backward. Uh, the, the number just explodes exponentially. So the Monte Carlo technique for doing sampling is a clever trick that was actually developed as part of the Manhattan Project. And it says the following. So I'm going to go back one moment here. And, and if you think about a brute force way to generate this integral, what you would do is you would randomly pick points R in phase space. You would just randomly decide where all your atoms are and what the momenta of all the atoms are. And then you would compute your property. You'd compute the energy so that you'd know the probability. And you'd add it in as a sum. A way to solve an integral that you don't have analytically is you construct it piecewise. However, you are weighting by the probability whatever the value is, and you are selecting randomly. What, what Monte Carlo does is uh, something along those lines. It generates a distribution that is already probabilistically weighted. And so here's basically what it does. And I'm going to illustrate on this slide, just for simplicity, I'm going to take a property that doesn't depend on momentum. And as a result, I'm only going to work in coordinate uh, space, not in momentum space. There certainly are many properties that don't depend on momentum. Say the, you know, the molecular dipole moment does not, in fact, depend on momentum. It's only a, a coordinate-dependent phenomenon. But what one does is you generate a population of geometries. We're only in coordinate space, so it's just geometries, in the, such that the number of representative structures for a given geometry follows the appropriate Boltzmann weighting. All right, so the number at geometry R1 divided by the number at geometry R2 will be dictated by the difference in energies for R1 and R2 divided by KT and the exponential of that. And how does one go about doing that? 
Well, what you do is you, you pick some starting geometry, R1, and then you propose a change. You might stretch a bond. You might rotate about a torsion. Whatever it is, you propose a new geometry. And you compute the energy for that new geometry. If the energy of the new geometry is lower than the old geometry, you would accept the move. If it is not, you compute the exponential of the energy difference, divide by kT, and you compare it to a random number between 0 and 1. So you need some random number generator, so the random number epsilon taken on the interval 0 to 1. And if you are greater than that random number, you will accept the move. Otherwise, you reject the move. And so here's a way to think about that. Uh, let's say I start here and I uh, find that my energy goes down as I uh, move from position one to position two. And I see on this slide, which I, I always hate to blame somebody I borrowed a slide from, but I see that there really should be a negative sign here if we're going to use this less than, or there should be a greater than symbol instead. The point is we accept a move if the energy goes down. So here the energy goes down and we accept it, right? Because at lower energy it ought to have a higher weight in our population. And then I'm going to propose another move. This is R2 going to R3. So if I go from 2 to 3, the energy goes down again, and so I accept it again. My next proposal, it turns out I actually propose to go up in energy by, because of the new geometry I chose. So that means I'm going to compute e to the minus a difference in energy that's positive, and I'll divide by kT, so I get e to minus a positive number over kT, so that'll be a number uh, between 0 and 1. I compare it to a random number, and it fails my test. It doesn't end up being greater than my random number. And as a result, I don't keep this geometry, I just put this one back into my list. I've been keeping track of these geometries. This is geometry 1, geometry 2, geometry 3, and because I rejected this proposal, it's also geometry 4. Now I try another move. Again, it's uphill in energy, but this time when I compute the exponential of the energy difference over kT, I do manage to exceed my random number. And as a result, I keep it, and this becomes the new geometry 5. And then I go down for geometry 6, so I keep that. So if I do this long enough, again and again and again and again, I will end up with a very large number of geometries, phase points if you like, and because I threw away high energy ones and kept low energy ones, they will be weighted by uh, the energy to be more heavily populated in low energy regions than high. And because of that, because my population is already energy weighted, all I have to do to find the expectation value is take the average over all the points I accumulated. So I did accumulate more points low energy than high. It's as though I've done the population weighting, and so just the average. So what you generate when you run one of these Monte Carlo simulations is effectively a very long file that'll just keep the positions of all the atoms for step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and so on. And maybe if you're doing momentum two, it wouldn't just be positions, it would be momentum. And at the very end, when you're satisfied that your uh, simulation has converged, you simply run through every one of the things that's written in your file and take the average of whatever property you may have computed at that point. So simulated annealing is an approach. I want to come back to this idea of how do I find the global minimum? So in simulated annealing, what we do is we start the Monte Carlo simulation at a very high temperature. And so if you think about what's involved, I'll go back here a slide, a very high temperature means that uh, this is a very large number in the denominator, and that means that very big energy differences will be divided by very large numbers, and as a result, you'll get e to minus a small number, so that's close to zero, for instance, and e to the zero will be one, and so our random number uh, generator will allow us to accept moves with high frequency. And again, I see that my, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so that's fine. Uh, it'll be very near one, so it'll exceed most random numbers we'll pick on that, uh, on that interval. So that's equivalent, then, if you like, to having a whole bunch of systems up here in energy. And so they can 
scroll around back and forth. It's no trouble hitting high energy uh, uh, phase points. But then if I lower the temperature over time, and time here refers to a simulation, notice that the Monte Carlo equations, they don't include time. There's no little t variable in there. Time here is after I took maybe a million steps of Monte Carlo, I'll lower the temperature. And as a result, I'm now at some medium T, so I'm exploring around and I'm starting maybe to bump into some barriers that are starting to populate me in various places. And finally, I'll lower the temperature even more, and if I'm doing this carefully, I'm likely to start falling into wells, and maybe I'll localize in the lowest of all energy wells. And if I have any doubts, of course, I can always raise the temperature again, explore a whole lot of geometries, and cool it down again. So that's like annealing a metal where if you want to get it into its lowest energy crystal form, for instance, you heat it up, all the atoms can move around, you cool it down, it falls into some crystalline form. It's not perfect enough for you, you heat it up again, uh, maybe you cool it more slowly, the goal being to uh, fall into the global minimum. Okay, and so at absolute zero, of course, you'd want to be right at the very bottom. If you do cool infinitely slowly, you should find the global minimum. That infinitely slowly part is a bit hard to do in practice, but that's the idea. Now, what about molecular dynamics? So in molecular dynamics, what we do is we solve Newton's equations of motion. You've got an initial position, r, and an initial velocity, which is dictated by uh, the user selecting velocities randomly, probably, and those velocities are dictated by temperature. So the total kinetic energy depends on the temperature. And from Newton's law, we can compute with a force field the forces on the atoms. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. So we use our force field to compute the force. And we know the mass of the atoms, so we know the acceleration. And if you know acceleration and velocity, and you take a small time step, you can propagate your trajectory to new positions, new velocities, recompute forces, get new accelerations, and just keep taking time steps. So total energy is conserved in this case. It's going to uh, vary between potential and uh, kinetic energy. And the ergodic hypothesis says that if you follow a trajectory long enough, you will sample phase space in an energy-weighted way, a properly energy-weighted way. And so that once again, you will evaluate an expectation value as an average over all the snapshots of your system. So what is a snapshot? Well, the very beginning geometry, geometry zero and velocity zero, that would correspond to a snapshot. And then I'll propagate over a very small time step after computing the forces, and I'll go to a new geometry and a new set of velocities. And remember, velocities are related to momenta. Uh, it's just that momenta have sign associated with them, and the velocities, the, well, the absolute value, if you like, uh, times the mass. And so I'll, pro I'll keep that in my list. So just like in Monte Carlo, I was keeping lists, so too in molecular dynamics, I'm keeping a list. And when I'm done, if I've let this uh, uh, trajectory run long enough, it should have spent more time in relevant regions of phase space. And so if you want to think of a little ball, again, rolling, the total energy is conserved at the little dashed line, but I'm going to be wandering all over on the potential energy surface, having more or less kinetic energy at various places. If I raise the temperature a lot so there's a lot of kinetic energy, I'm going to be zooming back and forth over the top of barriers. Right, so I'll be able to compute at a given point what is the potential energy, but I also have some kinetic energy. So quenching the dynamics consists of arbitrarily sucking away the velocities, if you like. So, and that's equivalent to lowering the temperature in molecular dynamics. So I reduce the temperature, uh, the velocities are all scaled down, and as a result, I have a total energy if I if I'm here, say, in these yellow arrows, my trajectory is zooming back and forth over these barriers, and I suddenly, maybe I get rid of all of the kinetic energy. I just come down on the potential energy surface, and now I just do molecular mechanics minimization. Right? I don't have kinetic energy. I'm just looking at the potential energy and following forces down to minima. I'll find this minimum, and if I did it over here, I'll find this minimum. So quenching anywhere along this trajectory, I can do minimizations and find all the minima until I'm satisfied that I've done as many as I like. So my trajectory might have a million snapshots, 
And every one of those snapshots, I could do a molecular mechanics minimization on and acquire all the minima. Of course, I have the hard work of deciding, have I found one I already had? I got to compare to all the ones that exist. But that is a way to, uh, to assemble the list of all minima. So note that you do require first derivatives here because we're computing forces in order to get velocities. Uh, and uh, second derivatives are used in minimization to make it more efficient, but aren't required for the trajectory itself. All right, that uh, ends what I want to say about uh, the basics of Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics. In the next video, we will take a look at some of the tools and tricks that are used in making these kinds of simulations practical.